In this video, we're reviewing the four main defensive actions that a team can use during a game. They are a catch, a tag, a throw, and a touch. These are rules that most fans think they know, but the important details are what umpires have to know in order to enforce these properly on the field. So in this video, we're going to review the four defensive actions, both the definitions and the rules, and then we'll dive into the associated case plays and break down the hardest questions. Now, if you want to see how well you can do on the quiz before going through the video, you can find the quiz in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber here with GHSA Baseball, Umpire Development, and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires to develop their knowledge and skills. Thank you so much everyone for helping us reach a thousand subscribers on YouTube. I hope I've done a great job bringing you value week after week. If there are any video ideas that you'd like to see, be sure to leave your ideas in the comments. Okay, let's jump into it. First, let's review a catch. The definition of a catch can be found in Rule 2-9-1, and it reads, A catch is the act of a fielder in getting secure possession in his hand or glove of a live ball in flight and firmly holding it, provided he does not use his cap, protector, mask, pocket, or other part of his uniform to trap the ball. The catch of a fly ball by a fielder is not completed until the continuing action of the catch is completed. A fielder who catches a ball and then runs into a wall or another player and drops the ball is not made a catch. A fielder at full speed who catches a ball and whose initial momentum carries him several more yards after which the ball drops from his glove has not made a catch. When the fielder, by his action of stopping, removing the ball from his glove, etc., signifies the initial action is completed and then drops the ball, will be judged to have made the catch. The same definition of a catch would apply when making a double play. It is considered a catch if a fielder catches a fair or foul ball and then steps or falls into a bench, dugout, stand, bleacher, or over any boundary or barrier, such as a fence, rope, chalk line, or a pre-game determined imaginary boundary line from the field of play. Falling into does not include merely running against such object. It is not a catch when a fielder touches a batted ball in flight which then contacts a member of the offensive team or an umpire and is then caught by a defensive player. Okay, so this is a long definition, but ultimately there's three things we're looking for when determining if we have a catch on a play. First, we're looking for a player to have secure possession of the ball in either their glove or hand. After that, we either need the momentum of the catch to stop or we need voluntary release. A good example for momentum of the catch would be if a fielder makes a diving play, holds onto the ball the entire time, then stands up and drops the ball, that fielder is going to be credited with a catch. Even though they didn't have voluntary release, they did have the momentum of the catch stop. An example of voluntary release would be an outfielder charging a fly ball and catching it on the run and immediately throwing it into the infield. Even though their momentum from the catch never stopped, because it was voluntary release, we have a catch. Now, it is important to note the exception on this rule, which is that if a ball is deflected by a defender and then bounces off an umpire or an offensive player, then the ball cannot be caught for an out. Also, there's a note along with this definition that we need to be aware of. It says, when a batted ball or a pitch is involved, the above definition of a catch applies. For any other thrown ball, the term is used loosely to also apply to a pickup or to the trapping of a low throw, which has touched the ground. A fielder may have the ball in his grasp, even though it's touching the ground while in his glove. Now, what happens when we have a catch on a play can be found in rule 8-4-1, and it reads, the batter runner is out when his fair hit or foul, other than a foul tip, which is not a third strike, is caught by a fielder, or such catch is prevented by a spectator reaching into the playing field. Then in 8-4-1E, the batter runner is also out when a third strike is caught by the catcher. Now, in enforcing these rules, there's another definition we need to know, which is the playing field. The playing field includes both fair and foul territory. Any areas beyond the playing field are considered dead ball territory. And when determining whether or not we have a catch on a play, there are three guidelines that umpires need to be aware of. First, it is a catch if the fielder has one or both feet in the playing field when they make a catch. 
even if the other foot is completely on the ground out of play. It is also a catch if both feet are in the air, but neither foot has touched dead ball territory. Number two is that after making a catch, if both feet are entirely within dead ball area, then the ball automatically becomes dead. Third is if the ball is caught after the fielder has established themselves in dead ball area, then it is not a catch. Also remember that whenever a dead ball follows a catch, there are instances where one or more runners may be awarded bases. Next, let's review a tag. Rule 8-4-1F. The batter runner is out when after a drop third strike or a fair hit, if the ball held by any fielder touches the batter before the batter touches first base. So this part is very basic. You can get a batter runner out by tagging them before they reach first base. Then when we go to rule 8-4-2H, it reads, a runner is out when he is touched by a live ball securely held by a fielder or is touched by a fielder's glove or hand with the live ball held therein while the runner is not touching his base. And this part of the rule simply expands that we can tag any runner that is not on a base. But we need to note that the ball is not securely held if it is dropped or bobbled after making the tag. Also, we need to note that when tagging a runner or batter runner, if we are tagging with the glove, the ball has to be in the glove. If we are tagging with the free hand, then the ball has to be in the free hand. Next, let's review a throw. To start, let's review rule 2-37-1. It reads, a throw is the act of voluntarily losing possession through having the ball leave the hand for a purpose other than a pitch. It may result in the ball being bounced, handed, rolled, tossed, or thrown. Next, let's go to rule 5-1-1G, where we see when a thrown ball becomes dead. Any thrown ball that is touched by a spectator, is intentionally touched by a non-participating squad member, goes into a stand or other dead ball area, or player bench, even if it rebounds to the field, or over or through or wedges in the field fence or lodges in an umpire's, catcher's, or offensive player's equipment or uniform is a dead ball. Now let's move on to an interesting definition that relates to a throw, umpire's interference. Rule 2-21-2 covers umpire interference and it says it is umpire interference when he inadvertently moves so as to hinder a catcher's attempt to throw. Now note from this definition that it can be inadvertent that we still have umpire's interference but it only applies to a catcher's throw. Then when enforcing umpire's interference we go to rule 5-1-2c. It is a delayed dead ball when the umpire interferes with the catcher who is attempting to throw. If the runner is not put out, the runner must return to the base occupied at the time of the pitch. Now this part of the rule might be the most important part for umpires to understand. When we have umpires interference, it's a delayed dead ball. Most likely the catcher still got the throw off. And if that throw does get down to second and retire the runner, then the result of the play is going to stand. However, if that throw does not retire the runner, then all runners are going to be returned back to their position at the time of the pitch. Finally, let's cover a touch. Now, the big difference between a tag and a touch is that a tag is applied to a runner, whereas a touch is applied to a base. See rule 8-4-1F, which reads, The batter runner is out if any fielder, while holding the ball in his grasp, touches first base or touches first base with the ball before the batter runner touches first base. So rule 8-4-1F covers a force out on the batter runner. Rule 8-4-2J covers a force out on all other runners. It reads, a runner is out when he fails to reach the next base before a fielder either tags the runner out or holds the ball while touching second base after the runner has been forced from the base he occupied because the batter became a runner with ball in play when other runners were on first base or on first and second, or on first, second, and third. There shall be no accidental appeals on a force play. No runner may be forced out if a runner who follows him in the batting order is first put out, including a batter runner who is out for an infield fly. So these rules shouldn't really shock anybody out there, but it is important to note that on an infield fly, the batter runner is immediately out. And because that batter runner is out, the force is removed on all other runners 
which is why an infield fly protects the offense. Because the batter runner is already out, the defense doesn't have an advantage of letting the ball drop and then trying to turn a cheap double play. Okay, so now that we've broken down the four main defensive actions, let's run through this week's case plays. Case play number one. B1 hits a ground ball to F5. The throw to F3 is wide, causing him to stretch for the catch. The ball arrives in time, but as F3 attempts to regain his balance, he drops the ball. Is the runner out? The correct answer here is no, this is not a catch. The act of trying to gain your balance is considered part of a catch. Case play number two. B1 hits a ground ball to F6, who throws to first. F3 juggles the ball so that it rolls up his arm and is clamped to his body by an elbow or forearm when B1 touches first. Is the runner out? The correct answer here is no. The reason being to have secure possession of the ball, the ball must be in either the glove or hand and cannot be wedged up against the body using a forearm. Case play number three. B1 hits a fly ball to F8. F8 gets the ball in his hands, but it is dropped when he falls to the ground and rolls over. Is this a catch? The correct answer here is no. His falling to the ground is considered momentum of the catch. And because he is in the act of falling and does not have voluntary release, there is no catch on this play. Case play number four. B1 hits a fly ball to F8. F8 gets the ball in his hands, but it is dropped when he collides with another fielder. Is this a catch? The answer again is no. The momentum of the catch carried him into another fielder, and because we don't have voluntary release, it's going to be a no catch. Case play number five. B1 hits a fly ball to F8. F8 gets the ball in his hands, but it is dropped when he collides with the wall. Is this a catch? And again, the answer is no. The momentum of the catch takes him through running into the wall and falling down, and because we don't have voluntary release, this is a no catch. Case play number six. B1 hits a fly ball to F8. F8 gets the ball in his hands, but it is dropped when he starts to throw to the infield. Is this a catch? Finally, the answer is yes. Because he is reaching in to take the ball out of the glove, and that's when he drops the ball, we have a catch and voluntary release. Case play number seven. B1 hits a pop-up in the infield over foul territory. F5 positions himself to catch the ball with one foot in the third base dugout and the other on the playing field. F5 catches the ball. Is this an out? The correct answer here is yes. Under high school rules, this is an out. The NFHS rules specifically state that so long as one foot is in the playing area, even if the other is in dead ball area, it is going to be a catch. Case play number eight. B1 hits a pop-up in the infield over foul territory. F5 positions himself to catch the ball with one foot in the third base dugout. The other foot is elevated above the playing field. F5 catches the ball, then falls into the dugout. Is this an out? The correct answer here is no. Because one ball is already in dead ball area and the other foot is not touching live ball area, this is a dead ball and we do not have a catch. Case play number nine. B1 hits a pop-up in the infield over foul territory. F5 positions himself to catch the ball, which is coming down inside the third base dugout. F5 jumps into the dugout and falls over the fence after catching the ball. His feet were never touching the playing field while he had the ball. Is this a catch? The correct answer here is yes. His feet were still over live ball territory when he gained possession of the ball. And so long as he maintained possession through the momentum of the catch, this is a catch even though he never had his feet down in live ball territory, but because his feet were never down in dead ball territory, he never established himself in dead ball area. Case play number 10. B1 hits a two hopper back to the pitcher. F1 gloves the batted ball, but cannot get the ball out of his glove. He quickly removes the glove with the ball that is securely stuck inside the webbing of the glove and shovels the glove to the first baseman who is in contact with first base. The first baseman catches the glove with the ball in it just before B1 touches first base. Is B1 out? The correct answer here is yes. B1 is out because F3 had secure possession of both the ball and the glove. Case play number 11. With R2 on second base, the umpire inadvertently interferes with the catcher's throw back to F1 and R2 advances to third base. The umpire's judgment is that R2 would not have reached third had the obstruction not occurred. 
Is this A, the play stands, the catcher must avoid the umpire, or B, the umpire shall call time and send R2 back to second? The correct answer here is B. This is a delayed dead ball. Remember that umpire interference can be inadvertent, and because the catcher's throw did not retire the runner, we're going to have to call a dead ball and send the runner back. Case play number 12. A ball thrown wildly to third base continues toward Team A's dugout and is intentionally touched by the bat boy for Team A. Is this A, the ball is dead immediately, or B, the ball is alive so long as the bat boy does not pick up the ball? The correct answer here is A, the ball is immediately dead when any personnel authorized to be on the field intentionally make contact with the ball. Now, if for some reason the bat boy is on the field and trying to get out of the way of the ball and gets hit by it, since that was not intentional contact, then the ball is going to remain live. With runners on second and first base, a double steal is called. R2 attempts to steal third, and the umpire interferes with F2's throw to second base. The throw does not retire the runner. Is this A, this is umpire interference, the umpire shall give the dead ball signal and return R2 to second and R1 to first, or B, this is umpire interference, the umpire shall give the dead ball signal and return R1 to first, because no play was being made on R2, R2 stays at third. The correct answer here is A. Because this is umpire's interference and the initial throw did not retire either runner, both runners are going to be sent back to their base at the time of pitch. Chase play number 14. With R3 on third, R1 on first, and no outs, R1 attempts to steal second. F2 is obstructed on his throw to second base by the plate umpire. The throw is cut off by the shortstop and relayed back to the plate in time to retire R3, trying to score. Is this A, the play stands, B, the defense can choose to take the results of the play or have umpire interference enforced, this results in R3 returning to third and R1 returning to first, or C, umpire's interference, R3's return to third, R1 is returned to first. The correct answer here is C. This is umpire's interference, and because the initial throw by the catcher does not retire a runner, we have to enforce the umpire's interference. There is no option to take the results of the play, and we are going to have to send R3 back to third and R1 back to first base. Case play number 15. With one out and R1 on first base, B3 hits a fly ball to short left field. R1 rounds second, but retreats towards first base when he thinks the ball will be caught. The ball drops, but F7 retrieves the ball and throws it to second base. R1 is between first and second. F4 touches second and walks away. Then R1 reaches second without being tagged. Is this A, R1 is out on a force out, or B, R1 is safe because R1 already touched second, they must be tagged to be put out. The correct answer here is A, R1 is out on the force out. When R1 retreated past second base, the force was reinstated, and this is a force out. Okay, everyone, there you have it. This week's review of the four most common defensive actions. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out the other videos in this series, which you can find linked in the video description. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Thanks everyone for doing what you can to be a better umpire for high school baseball. We appreciate the work you put into this. And as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.